Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's workshop, workshop number 42. My name is Xiao Feng Tao, professor of Beijing University of Post and Telecommunication, BUPT, also a member of Consultative Committee on UN Information Technology, CCIT, China Association for Science and Technology. I will chair this workshop, Internet of Things for Smart City, Green and Sustainability, Internet for Smart City for short. You may agree with me that smart city is the future, is the future of urbanization and its foundation is information technology, especially integrating IoT, Internet of Things, big data, and so on. This session will introduce what IoT is for smart city and how it can improve life quality, foster economy growth, and deliver on sustainability. In this workshop, we have invited six speakers to give talks on various topics, ranging from smart city framework, technical method, security, and policies. Hope you will find them informative and enjoyable. And uh, I want, uh, uh, let's begin. Uh, I want to uh, make brief presentation first. Okay, uh, next page. Uh, you can see uh, today's internet is recognized for three natures. The first one, openness. Second one, equal basis. Both these two means anybody can access information on the internet and participate on equal basis. The second one is collaboration. The collaboration using the internet has many advantages, such as instant information exchange, low cost, sometimes almost free, and green. The shared eco economy that we already have is essentially a collaborative economy where people collaborate. It is expected that such a person-based collaboration will become scenes-based collaboration in the Internet of Things. By adoption of Internet of Things technology, traditional industry production will combine the new information technology by using, just like I said, IoT, big data, AI, cloud services, and so on. Please, next page. Here, I'll give you some example. Traditional uh, distribution systems require a large number of persons to sort and distribute the goods from the, source, from the source to consumers. You can see the left figure. However, uh, today's uh, distribution systems start to use IoT technology to facilitate and monitor the movement of goods. You can see the middle figure. Some IoT-based distribution systems can serve more than 18,000 items per hour, three times than the person-based system with a round-the-clock working style. You can see uh, the right figure. Some Chinese company has also studied trial tests for new trunks without driver. This white trunk can carry five packages at once and travel uh, 20 kilometers. Maybe uh, we are about to see them soon. Uh, next page, please. Here also a second example uh, you can see. Let's consider two solutions to meter reading. The left one 
is the traditional million meter reading solution. An employee can read about 18 to 100 in-house gas meter per day in a typical Chinese city. Hundreds of million residential houses across the country need to high labor and management costs. Moreover, what about electricity meter and watt meter? The right one is smart way use IoT technology. IoT enable stable real-time data collection from more than one utility meters like gas, electricity, water, and more, we can analyze this meter data to implement, 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 implement best management of the city. The new solution you can see at the right side can be uh, greener by using IoT technology. Here is an example of uh, an IoT-based gas reader uh, this one used in Shanghai, uh, gas group. It is shown that this gas reader equipment is about 100 times energy efficiency. Then that is GSM-based reader. You know, GSM-based is uh, second-generation mobile communication systems. And this one uses MB IoT technology, layer band uh, IoT technology. This belongs to 4G. Please, next slide. Here is an uh, example for transportation in Shenzhen. The cooperator cooper uh, with IoT-based camera, base stations, and the government can cooperate to add a new dimension to existing intelligent transportation systems, has a great potential to improve the road safety and uh, decrease traffic congestion. Here is uh, the ITS, uh, here is the, IT, is the ITS, it is the commander center in Shenzhen. The information, for example, traffic, ticket, and so on, are projected in a single big screen. It is the commander center in a real-time manner. The right hand finger uh, is a web screen, short for city traffic information, like when and where experienced a high traffic congestion. Citizens can visit, can visit this website anytime, anywhere. Next slide, please. Uh, the, above, the above three examples, together with other IoT applications, will lead to a much bigger concept, smart city. Based on the forest research in the year 2009, it says the smart city will use an intelligent architecture that can lack critical city infrastructure components, such as transportation, healthcare, 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 education, emergency response, and utilities. IoT and smart city is expect, expected to huge improve life quality. Uh, next. Developing a smart city is, has so uh, many advantages, as I mentioned in a previous slides. Many cities in the world are becoming smarter and smarter. Uh, China is a big player in this area. Ne uh, now nearly 500 cities are big beginning their smart city plan. Uh, next, please. So uh, there's still some uh, challenges, uh, just a uh, last uh, part of them, uh, which uh, can be viewed from uh, the following aspect. Security and uh, privacy, uh, this is very important. Uh, when everything is collected, uh, that means anyone in the world can collect you. How do IoT uh, companies to protect, uh, protect our personal information. Uh, this is very important. Second, uh, smart city and policy. Uh, what is the role of the uh, policy maker, uh, government, and the company, uh, and the consumers? And uh, 
for example, a technique method also very important. Uh, uh, the, the first one may be a uh, home behavior, uh, where our behavior be uh, affected by those, by those uh, new technologies. So this is also very important. Can we reserve our traditional or customers? Okay, I'll uh, just uh, give a brief, quick uh, uh, presentation. So uh, second, I want to uh, invite uh, Miss Galpaya. Yes. Uh, Galpaya, Miss uh, Galpaya. Uh, Miss Galpaya's topic is about mobile network and big data. Uh, let's welcome Miss Galpaya, uh, the CEO. I'm sorry, it's a company name. Uh, Lenasia. Uh, Lenasia. Uh, uh, please. Right. Um, I work, I run a think tank called Learn Asia. We work in South Asia and Southeast Asia. I'm gonna take a very different view uh, to this in the sense everyone in the countries we work in, with this, which, you know, in India, Sri Lanka, the IoT is huge, everyone is talking about smart cities. Yet there's really no serious implementation we can study. Yes, we can study Korea, uh, nothing in South Asia in a meaningful way. We are at the very early stages. However, this doesn't mean that our cities don't have these problems and we use other types of sensors uh, which are not what you fix on buses and not what you fix on weather stations. Next slide, please. Next. So these are the countries that we normally work in. Yep. Next. Right. So for us, what's interesting is that it, there's huge rates of urbanization in um, Asia overall, certainly in the poorer countries. And uh, next, oh, yeah, sorry, please. Um, and our question is, how do we make these cities more livable? We are behest with traffic jams. Um, we are behest with <coughs> dengue and malaria, which are spreading uh, seasonal, and now they're mostly endemic in some of these countries and many other things. And how do we use data to answer these questions? Next slide. Next. So there's a, a whole lot of data that you can, no, I'm sorry, before? Yeah. There's a whole lot of data that you can use, um, and obviously there's you know, the administrative data that you can get from government, uh, and the commercial transactional data, including bank records, all of that, online activity on social media, sensors and tracking devices, right? Which is what you were mostly talking about in terms of IoT, the last one. Next slide, please. However, in the absence of sensors and tracking devices, humans are the best tracking device walking around in cities and rural areas. Uh, mobile subscriptions are very high, even if people are not using the internet, they are using a digital signal in the form of a call detail record or a VLR, visitor location registry, and that trace is left in the telecom operator's network. So thanks to high mobile penetration, we actually have a digital map of something that's going on in these cities. Next. So we actually use the call detail records in together with some population data, we use historically historical data, pseudonymized, in order to protect people's privacy, uh, and from multiple mobile operators in the countries we work in, and I will present an example in Sri Lanka. Next. We can skip this. Right. Next slide, please. So how do we actually use it to solve uh, city problems? Uh, one of the problems is because cities are fast, so fast changing and sensors are done once every 10 years, and if you're lucky, we get the, our, the data out another three years later, there's no really real-time estimate of where people live and what population densities are. These are incredibly important to identify where diseases might spread, for example, uh, so density really matters. And on your left-hand side is the uh, population density based on the government um, a survey a census that was done last on two, in 2012. In the middle is the population density data for the same uh, sort of geographical breakdowns based on our data, which is much more real time. Uh, and as you can see, the mapping is very accurate. Uh, and on the right-hand side, 
is even more granular mapping, which you can do, in, especially in high density areas where there's more than one cell tower. So you can actually get quite granular data that the administrative data through the census and surveys do not capture to identify where real density is at any given point in time. And this is important for cities. Next slide. You can also identify where people are at any given time of day, which is kind of like before the density, but more importantly, where people come from. So this is a zoom in on the city of Colombo, which is on the southwest coast, the, uh, the commercial capital of Sri Lanka. And as you can see, depending on the weekday or weekend and at different timestamps, you can see the population <coughs> hubs. The red areas are where the pe people are coming into. So you can see there's an influx of people into Colombo. And the more blue it is, it's where people have come from. Right, so you can see at this level of resolution where people have come into the city and then we can zoom down and see more specifically from where they have actually come granular areas. This is important in transport planning. So we use a more granular uh, level of this to work with the Colombo Megapolis Plan, which is one of the biggest development projects in Sri Lanka, to help plan where to put the big trans multimodal transport hubs where people should come and park and then get onto trains, the park and ride system, for example. Uh, what is the congestion and so on at any given time and then therefore more advanced you know, traffic routing mechanisms can be used. Next slide, please. So just to give you why this is a good idea, I mean, it's not like you can't get origination destination data for people by doing surveys, and we do that. We stop people in, uh, on the road, the government, in heavy traffic and ask them to do surveys, or they come <coughs> home. You can't be doing these surveys in traffic, so you, then you go to people's house. These are beset with memory problems about average trips taken and so on. So on the left-hand side is our data showing where people, the population, sort of where people live and come from. And on the right-hand side is the transport survey data that was funded by the Japanese government. You have pretty good uh, a mix. And in fact, you can identify population or density hubs that you didn't actually get in the administrative data through the actual uh, call detail record based analysis that you see on the left hand side. Let's go next. Uh, I'll skip this. This is where people travel and come from in the interest of time. Next slide. Yeah, great. No, one before, please. Thank you. Uh, this is to understand the impact of transport. So we built Sri Lanka, one of our, f our second highway ever <laughs> was built uh, Colombo to Katanaga, connecting the airport into the city. What happens when you build um, a new highway? Uh, do people travel more? Do they travel further? What happens to labor mobility? Are people better off or worse off? These are questions we can answer and incredibly important in deciding whether you should do more infrastructure investment. Next slide. So for example, uh, the E3 is the expressway that I talked about and we can see that in the expressway the traffic increased and much more than on other routes. So you get a sense of how much the expressway was used uh, compared to other alternative uh, routes. And then you can do local level surveys to understand what actually did that, that did to labor mobility. Next slide. We can also go further. We can understand the level of localized travel, incredibly important in planning local travel, which includes not just buses, but our tuk-tuks and auto systems. Uh, which take, uh, take people from, let's say, the big bus stations into more you know, uh, close by areas. So this is not just to understand from what city you're going to another city. This is at a more local level, how do people move around? And to identify sort of transport, auto, people's transport networks, where do most people go? Those are the routes that should be optimized. Next slide. Understanding traffic conditions. This is, of course, new in some countries, very um, sort of well done in many developing countries. So we can't do this with the mobile network big data that I talked about. We use CCTV footage and recognition to look at um, traffic conditions. Next slide. In a completely different example, we look at diseases. 
Uh, malaria has been around for a while, but that's less of a problem. The new problem, for example, in Sri Lanka is dengue. Again, a mosquito or vector-borne disease where one of the biggest determinants of how it spreads is where people move, particularly infected people move from one place to the other. Therefore, it spreads when a mosquito bites them in that place. So people movement is incredibly important. Um, on the left hand, on the right hand side is what actually happened for a given period of time. The actual incidence of cases in Sri Lanka for this period of time under study. On the left hand side is our predictive model using mainly the mobile call detail records and some other rainfall data, um, vegetation, and a whole set of population data that we did. And the model, as you can see, is actually very accurate about the likelihood of spreading. In fact, our fault is that we possibly over-predict in some areas, uh, which is darker color than the actual incidence. But we think actually this is a good problem to have because at least you've identified where it's likely to spread. And this we're talking, you know, thousands of people dying, so this actually matters uh, in, in our country. Next slide. Uh, establishing data sharing agreements is incredibly hard, especially because we are an independent research think tank. I think establishing multiple operators, agreeing, getting them to agree to share data is very, very hard because they are worried about commercial interest about where their base stations are will be leaked to other operators and so on. So this is just a, this examples I showed you was based on data which took us 24 months to negotiate an incredible transaction cost. Next slide, please. However, getting government data is no easier and you think this would be. And governments put huge restrictions on who can access data and what conditions need to be met. For example, just to get granular census data, not to identify any households at a much higher level, you need to write research proposals, they'll give you 20% of the data, then you prove the concept, then you get 80% of the data. However, this kind of big data analysis cannot be done with 20% of the data. They're missing the whole point. N equals all is the whole basis of running algorithms to identify patterns, right? And they don't know how to actually meaningfully sample and give us even a good sample of data. So this is a real problem. Next. So we really need public-private data partnerships if this kind of very basic IoT of humans is to work. And certainly the other stuff, because the government has low capacity, uh, they cannot do some of these things. They need to bring in the experts, and we don't have experts to, we don't have ac access to, sometimes even the experts, we don't have the capacity either sometimes. We need to reach out to universities. We need to open up the data through APIs so that uh, data that doesn't violate people's privacy can be shared, and there is a lot. The debate about data sharing is at the moment, I think, clouded by privacy, which is an incredibly important component. But there's so much data that can be shared without having to worry about privacy. So we need to separate out these two tracks, have meaningful conversations about what can be shared and how, versus what should be extremely highly protected and even maybe kept localized and within the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have some, some time to answer one question? Sure, sure. Uh, because uh, Ms. Uh, Del Payer will leave, so one question to her, okay. Hi, um, I, I'm an environmentalist, so it's more on the environmental question. I was wondering if um, the government would be more likely to give you the material, the raw material, if you framed the um, request as an environmental request, so reducing pollution by knowing the data uh, instead of um, the government having a broader uh, transportation uh, strategy, having a more focused strategy because they're meeting yeah. the needs of the people. Um, in this instance, no. In fact, framing it as a let's help you figure out the transport problem was much more useful because coincide, coinciding with what we were doing is that the World Bank came up with this Colombo Megapolis plan, huge grant that was being given, or loan actually, uh, and therefore they actually now needed to understand where to put the roads and where to put you know, infrastructure, and nobody knew this, and therefore this was one of the reasons they actually let us in through the door. So that policy window might be different in your context. Maybe the debate is, okay, listen, this is about the environment and if the government cares, and in our case, it actually was transport, luckily. Okay. 
sur le quad Je commence là. Just to make sure. The que uh, just short question. Uh, you are uh, doing uh, a, a, a great effort to di digitalize the smart cities everywhere uh, in in your region as well. But uh, how to uh, do it with ensuring privacy and human rights is the issues of citizens who are. Uh, I know uh, uh, that is, but uh, the system works automatically. Could it, uh, some citizens, for example, be against their data to be collected, their data to be analyzed, for example, their geographical position or something else? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I in this case, for example, so we don't actually get from the telecom operators anything to about where they work or live or their names or ID cards or anything like that, right? Of course, there are ways algorithms can determine where people live with great certainty, at least down to like a Voronoi cell because this is the cell phone base station records that we use. If we try, we can. We have chosen to get it on a historical basis so it's not real time. So before they flush it out of the system, we quickly go and get like a trillion records and then we go again and get a trillion records. Uh, this is not uh, something that actually has been solved uh, because even the data we have, it is possible at some point in the future in combination with other digital traces like credit card information, you know, may be solvable. However, all of these data traces really are non-existent with 4% credit card penetration, right? Uh, I think that, so as I said before, we need to understand which data is sensitive and which is not. However, it's not just about privacy, it is also about inclusion. So if, for example, you look at the Boston um, City deployed a street bump app, which is on the smartphone, the accelerometer sort of identifies a, steep bump, a, street, uh, a bump on the road or a pothole if you're driving around, right? This is a great source of data to identify where the potholes are, so you send the crew and then you, want, you, know, and then you fix it. So this was seen as a great thing. Then suddenly the privacy side came and said, look, this is hugely problematic, you're identifying where people are, etc." Then third, the other side of the lobby came up and said, you know what, rich people who live in Back Bay have smartphones. Poor people who live in the South End don't have smartphones. So now you're suddenly going to identify potholes in the rich areas and only fix those potholes, and you're not going to identify the potholes where the poor people live because they don't have accelerometers in their smartphones. In fact, they don't have smartphones. So I think we need to go to the next step, which is to say, yes, I understand there's a representation problem, because smartphones are with a particular group of people and they live here. The city needs to know that. However, poor countries need to optimize resources. So I don't see anything wrong with a city saying, I will use that with the people who have smartphones, but I will use my old real life crew who used to go around in the engineering van, actually physically looking at potholes. I will deploy them now into the poorer areas because I know I'm not going to get a signal from there, right? So you've suddenly optimized your resources because you only maybe have one engineering van to go into all over the city. Now you only have to cover a small part of the city. So I think it, it's a lot more complex than saying privacy or not, inclusive or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to go. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Uh, Mr. Wong is the president of Australian Computer uh, Society, and his topic is about experience of developing smart city in Australia. Mr. Wong, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Tao. Uh, thank you first to the China Association of Science and Technology for s inviting me to speak today. My topic is about IoT and smart cities in, in Australia, and particularly, I like to take a different focus because Helene is talking about data, <laughs> okay. um, and I believe Avetik is gonna talk about security. So we're gonna cover a whole range of spectrums of the topic on IoT and smart cities here today. So I'm gonna focus more on the challenges, particularly who owns the data from IoT devices. So 
My background is I'm a lawyer. I specialize in privacy, uh, technology, intellectual property law. I'm also a technologist. I was an ex-CIO as well. Uh, I'm the president of the Australian Computer Society, um, also on the board of IFIP, the International Federation for Information Processing that was, uh, that was uh, created by UNESCO about 60 years ago and we're based in Austria. So I physically live in Sydney, Australia, uh, but we're part of the international body of computer societies around the world. Um, so Professor Zhao's already mentioned about what IoT is and where it's going. I'm particularly more focused on Australian perspective. Uh, Australia being a developed country, as you can see from that slide, uh, the penetration of IoT devices and mobility devices are pretty high. Uh, one of the statistics from our recent government report uh, indicate that uh, over 90 percent of Australians will will be online by 2017, which is this year, really. And the average Australians own 24 devices already which are connected online. So these are some of the statistics. So we are heavily utilise uh, devices uh, in the Australian landscape. Uh, also, in the next slide talks about McKenzie report looking at the benefit of IoT in the Australian context and its contribution to the economic well-being of Australians. Last year, the Australian government announced uh, the Australian Smart City Initiative um, to make Australian cities and region areas more livable and using uh, more recent technology and, and, and smarter technologies and IoT. But as everybody knows, there are no real smart cities in the world. Yes, we have many projects to do about smart cities and IoT, but those are, are coming up, but they are separate, discrete projects. Uh, there is no really functional smart cities that I can see today, but that will be changing very shortly. So in terms of the Australian landscape on smart cities initiative, you look at many uh, from using data for transport in Sydney, and many cities around Australia so that you can get real-time information about buses and trains and getting from A to B or even tracking the uh, buses and trains and, and the time they arrive at your destination. Uh, we're also looking at street lighting meters, uh, trials of autonomous cars and many, many of those uh, smart city projects. Australia in the recent ranking uh, from the company Easy Park uh, just last month, rang Melbourne number 10 and Sydney number tw 12 in smart city assessment. Uh, it rated Aust Melbourne and Sydney very high in terms of 4G penetration. Uh, citizen participation in both Melbourne and Sydney is pretty high at 9.82% out of 10, 9.55 out of 10. So in terms of also smart penetration, uh, 9.3 out of 10. So Australia uh, fared pretty well in terms of using mobility devices and IoT, uh, but at the present time, uh, pretty poor in terms of clean energy and environmental protection. So last year, the Australian government has launched an initiative to fund uh, IoT and smart city projects around Australia by investing in 50 million of that, 28 million's already been allocated uh, to a number of cities and projects around Australia, including in the city of Darwin, uh, 5 million uh, to, sweet, to make this Darwin city uh, smart with smart lighting, parking, wireless, and, wire, and, and CCTV cameras. In addition to that, 5 million's been allocated to a city north of Sydney, Newcastle, uh, to make the city smart and in making it like a living uh, digital lab to experiment on the smart city concept uh, in the many areas that we've already canvassed. So I don't want to go through that detail, uh, but you can see from the slides, uh, those normal projects of IoT smart cities, those are now starting to roll out in cities like Newcastle in Australia. 
of particular interest to this topic because we're talking about green and sustainability living. Uh, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, nearly a million dollars was granted to a regional park in Perth in terms of sustainability and green ecotourism. So using, utilizing IoT sensors, satellites and drones to better manage uh, the park's diversity wetlands uh, in real time. So they could be used for the management and the running of the park, which is very close to the city of Perth. So this is just another example of what, what's happening in terms of smart projects in Australia. Asia Pacific from a recent ranking from Bordafone IoT Barometer, it indicates the Asia Pacific region uh, is one of the highest adopters of IoT. As you look from the slide, 36% of Asia Pacific companies have adopted IoT compared to 27% America and 26% in Europe. Uh, in terms of uh, companies also committed to collaboration with IoT, uh, Asia Pacific at 92% compared to 72 and 77 in America and Europe. So what are the challenges of, of IoT and smart devices? As you know, there are many. Uh, one, of this, uh, one of the participants asked about privacy uh, today. Unfortunately, I'm not talking about privacy. I have a whole presentation for an hour just on privacy alone. Uh, so the six minutes that I have would not allow me to talk much about privacy, but to mention that obviously that's an area that of, of interest to a lot of people. So what are some of the city challenges? I think one of the primary ones is about the debate of interest between the public and the private interest. If you're going to build a new smart city or adapt an old city to make it smart, who's going to decide on what, when and why some of these projects get to go about? Uh, obviously, uh, cities have evolved in some instances over centuries, so there are laws and governance which have evolved in a peaceful peace fashion over decades and, and hundreds of years. Uh, so we have to look at that in terms of how do we change those structures and regulatory system to enable smart cities which require very different thinking. And the other issues also, as some of the speakers will mention today, some of the social economic issues and who are going to finance some of these projects in smart cities. So from the Australian perspective, uh, the Australian government has allocated 50 million to help uh, cities around Australia.
text, I want to invite uh, Mr. Academy of, of Information.
uh, mobility as a resource uh, defined and also described as a more uh, social approach because we trust to someone's recommendation, right, when we are choosing one or another service. So uh, um, we should explore those characteristics of mobility uh, in a more smart way. And actually, of course, we have a tendency of exchanging humans, right? Because we have mobile predictive services, we have mobile consultancy, we have mobile management, mobile logistics, right? It is quite interesting, so I will tell you more about that. But I also would like to remind you that today there was, uh, I would say, big step towards regulation of, uh, let's say, Uber, you know, business models, because you probably heard that uh, high court uh, of the EU, right, uh, said that Uber is uh, not an internet company, it is a taxi company, which means that they are going to pay taxes. I mean, influence uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, new services, influence of exchanging human beings, introducing new platforms. Anyway, it also, you know, there should be some consequences in terms of uh, taxes, of course, right? We will see how it will go, right? But anyway, uh, trend is here. You know, we are trying to exchange humans, we are trying to have peer-to-peer -peer connection and so on. Next slide, please. But uh, first I would like to shortly tell you that uh, one of our research projects, which we conducted with my colleagues at the School of Business and Mathematics, uh, was uh, focused on agent-based modeling of social web of things. What is social web of things? So network of shared services by people and devices via social network. So actually both of those agents, humans or devices, they exchange information, they exchange data, right? And so main focus was uh, um, on, um, uh, main focus was on behavior actually of humans while exchanging the data or information with devices. And the idea was to uh, make, a, you know, modeling uh, of, um, you know, agent-based modeling where humans, they are presented uh, as agents, right? Uh, as well as smart devices. Actually, uh, they also can establish network connections with each other and with devices itself. And so we tried to research, uh, to tr try to answer to, you know, the question, will, um, that connection shape human's behavior or not. A theoretical study showed that in 90%, actually, as you can see here, um, uh, average resource request from the humans towards services, towards, you know, smart.
uh, Vetti will open on IoT security issues in detail. So uh, now it's time for Q&A. Any questions or comments? Please. It's, it works now. Yeah, my name is Ji Hao Jing, uh, MEG member from China. Um, obviously, um, the the future of uh, IoT and the smart city is very promising. But uh, after listening to the panelists, we also uh, we are also aware that uh, there are lots of challenges: the bandwidth, the hardware, software, you know, uh, hacking by enemy states or terrorists. You know, uh, if uh, a whole city, the key infrastructure, the key platforms are controlled by terrorists, the consequence would be catastrophic. And, uh, um, you know, that, that is one thing. Um, in this, another thing is that uh, um, to, to, uh, to set up such kind of system, we have a problem of uh, data sharing. Some data are uh, generated by, by the public uh, system, like the traffic control, uh, visual uh, surveillance uh, owned by the governments. But uh, we also need data from those uh, commercial platforms like DD, uh, taxi, etc. Um, I'm wondering how the governments, or city governments or national governments, get those data or share those data with those commercial platforms. Do we need to? put in place, uh, you know, legislation first, or the government just uh, struck a deal with uh, uh, each company separately? How do China and other countries are doing in this, in this regard? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two questions. The first question, I want to invite you <laughs> to give a brief answer. A second question, I want uh, Mr. Wu. Okay. I think that uh, uh, to, uh, when we are talking about how government uh, should handle these issues, I think that uh, there should be um, a kind of approach where the government should take the role of uh, uh, compliance issues that should be forced by the vendors because there are a number of standards and if someone is, not, is uh, compromising, even from hardware or from software, mm -hmm. they should be punished. This is my belief, because government cannot, and cannot go into the technical uh, details into the system, how they work. But uh, the standards are forcing these uh, security issues from te te technical perspective. Okay, thank you. Please, Mr. The Australian government has adopted open data policy and sharing. Um, so the premise is most public government data should be available uh, unless there are some other concerns like privacy, which limits their availability. But in terms of private and public enterprise sharing, I don't at the moment see much of that happening, but it would need to happen. And uh, But the issue is some private companies think that data they collect are their proprietary information. Uh, some companies actually trade with those information. They actually use that as a way of like financial data. They actually sell or license the data for a fee. So there are implications uh, which is kind of complex, but that would have to be managed through as those issues are being dealt with. So it's a matter of negotiation with those private companies for access to data. Uh, one of the things I could say is if the government is, a, is, is uh, allowing licensing of operators to come to the country, to operate where their data that they like to get access to, maybe as part of that negotiation to ensure that it's embedded in the contracts, in the agreement to start with, so that the data could be used, 
or at least determine as to who owns the data and how they could be shared and controlled. So these are some of the mechanism uh, framework that you can start thinking of. But currently, I think it's when you deal with private enterprise, it's a matter of negotiation and, and uh, to start with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there some questions from the room? Yes. So that's it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, we do have a very active participant online and uh, quite a few questions. We got uh, seven questions now. And uh, uh, I tried to uh, make an uh, integration on this question. I found uh, there are some questions we have been, uh, it has been arose by the on-site uh, participant about the security of uh, LOT device. I think uh, our speaker already answered partially. It's, uh, it's a question arose by the rather low hand from Pakistan and other question from Wahid about uh, the measure uh, of uh, security uh, on uh, LOT device. So I think uh, uh, we need, we have still have time to talk about uh, other questions. Uh, it has been divided two categories. Uh, some of questions are concerning on the uh, environmental. Uh, the participant uh, uh, want to know which mechanism or process can be used in smart city to face the environmental pollution and uh, the uh, distortion to the environment and uh, what's the value uh, for these challenges for the future structure of smart city. Okay. And uh, shall I finish? Uh, other question uh, focus on the people. Uh, they want to know the uh, effect of LOT for the people, like uh, rep replacement of uh, human resource, and also the people living in the uh, less developed area or country, uh, how they can adapt to the change uh, br brought by the LOT device. Okay. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the first question I want to invite Mr. Liu. Can you ask the question? You mean pollution? About uh, pollution. <laughs> so I, think I can, okay. I, I guess. I don't have any material about pollution. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the first question about pollution, uh, I think currently the, the merge should uh, scheme, for example, well, uh, WSN, wireless sense network, maybe is a possible uh, solution for the pollution. The second one, Second one is for uh, effect, effect to the, uh, uh, the people, the people, maybe, uh, to the people. The yeah. less I think all, almost the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. the same, same, same story happened several times in history. Mm -hmm. I think we sh should could get a solution or get another a, a job, uh, job chance, job ch uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, replace uh, this kind of people's uh, 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 opportunity, yeah. This is just quite <laughs> quick answer. Uh. So, uh, another, please. Only one question because <laughs> almost uh, now out, out of time. One question. Yeah. It's, it's me. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, dear all. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, so, sorry, my name is Mohamed. I'm coming from France, and I'm. Um, uh, uh, an industrial engineer, and uh, and I teach supply chain and, and purchasing. So um, <laughs> I'm very interesting uh, about the the mutation of the the industry and the behavior. The key question is: there is a, a big difference between data and behavior. Behavior related to your predictive compartment, and if we go further. It, uh, uh, it is related to your, your soul, your personality. So we don't deal with data. We deal, we deal with the, 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 the nexus of, of the humanity. So who is able to control this? And 
the second question, uh, what, where is the right for anon anonymity? Because uh, we are a, civiliza a civilization on movement and uh, our data, uh, uh, we can follow our data through, the, through uh, our internet uh, action on the web and also through the internet of things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Please, uh, so yes, a uh, quick answer. I would like to remind you about development of trains, jets, I'm not talking about cars, right? And just imagine how many people first were not using trains, jets, you know, cars, right? You all remember that very nice picture, you know, I think New York, right, where we had horses and carriages there, and after that several years, you know, after that we had cars almost everywhere, right? And so the same happening here. You know, um, as a humans, we, we are not used to, you know, to change our behavior and adopt some, you know, new things unless we understand the value. And so I think the main idea is trying to, uh, to explain the value, you know, of, of IoT, right? Of course, we should also be careful about privacy and personal data protection. That's why we should ask, you know, people first if they would like to participate in that, you know, project or not. Right? Thank you. The, this lady first, please. Thank you for the session. My name is Natalia Fodic. I'm a researcher based in Washington D.C. My question relates to. Uh, 5G and to what extent these technologies will truly be based on 5G only or you also have technologies based on unlicensed spectrum, uh, you know, can, connecting all this. Yeah, uh, MBIoT, actually MBIoT belongs to 4G. 5G, maybe uh, 5G, three uh, scenarios. One scenario is IoT, massive connection, this is for 5G. For MB-IoT, layer band IoT belongs to 4G. 5G names mass, uh, massive connection. This is for 5G. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry because uh, time uh, ran out. Uh, thanks again for all speakers uh, for their excellent presentation. I would like to also thank everyone who joined us this afternoon. After this uh, workshop, I believe that now we uh, have a clearer understanding of the current IoT development worldwide from Asia to Europe to Oceania. Hope our exchange and discussion will contribute the development of IoT for smart city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can uh, take pictures together. Okay. Shall we see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Together. Thank you. Please take a picture together. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, please <laughs> join us. Join us.